Welcome to the Indian Silicon Valley podcast. I'm your host Jivraj and in this episode I bring to you the power of compounding with Ranjit Pratap Singh of Pratilipi. Pratilipi for those who may not know is an online storytelling platform with over 25 million monthly active users bringing content in the form of literature, stories, comics, graphics and much much more including audiobooks and podcasts. Ranjit is an absolutely amazing founder and brings out such amazing insights throughout the episode. I learned much about hiring principles, decision making processes and had an absolute treat throughout the episode. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. Let's dive in. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Mr. Ranjit Pratap Singh on the show. Thank you so much Ranjit for joining me. It's such a pleasure to host you. Thanks a lot Jivraj. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to hear that Ranjit and very very curious to understand more about what Pratilipi has been doing and what how you landed up here but before we dwell into it i want to address something head on right so i like to call this episode and your journey it, and to relate it a lot with compounding right so i want to first start understand from you what your opinion on the power of compounding is and how have you observed it through the life cycle of pratilipi and in your life perhaps as well uh, so that be a great way to start the episode right so i think multiple smart and successful people have basically called compounding as the eighth wonder of life i think a lot of times this is something that we as human beings kind of forget but even small or incremental gains if they are kind of let them run for a multiple uh, years or a long period of time they can have insane impact uh, as a example i think probably the most successful investor of all times warren buffett Uh, has been growing his wealth at about 21 22 23% and that doesn't really sound uh, like that doesn't sound enough to be to be known as the greatest investor ever like 22 23 24% is high but it's not like abnormally high right. what makes this really really special is that he has grown at that pace since he was like 10 or 11 year old so when you grow at the same pace for like 70 80 years it ends up making you the richest man on the planet and that is what if you look at all of the great companies all of the great investors uh, this is something that is a running theme like and the great example is amazon uh, and right from the time that it was conceptualized they haven't really had that many breakthrough years where they have grown at 500% but they just continue to grow at a very very fast clip for a very sustained and long period of time so i think compounding is really valuable both in your personal life and in your professional life for sure for sure can you perhaps sanjee tell us also a bit about you know how pratilipi in its life cycle has used the power of compounding and how you value the principle uh, in practice like so pratilipi is weird in many ways and i think some of those ways probably will come across during the course of our conversation one of those ways was that we have always thought of growth as a happy by product of trying to do the right things so if you look at pratilipi's growth path you will see that it's very rare that there have been months or quarters we have where we have grown by 400% or 500%. What has happened is that we have almost consistently grown at 50% quarter on quarter for last 5 years running a straight. And when you look at it once in a while then it seems like 50% quarter on quarter for a consumer internet company is good, but it's not like phenomenal. It's not something that like that kind of raises eyebrows that you know what this company is growing phenomenal. But once you look at that 50% growth like quarter on quarter for 5 years then it starts to look something which is very very impressive and world class in fact i remember that uh, just a couple of months back uh, i had posted a message on twitter that it took us 5 years uh, to get to five, uh, like to get to 10 million users i think mm-hmm. and then 5 more months to add 10 more million users mm-hmm. now that seems insane but it's really not when you think about compounding it's just that the next 10 million of users that came along they came along at a bigger base which is why that seems insane but the fact is that essentially we have grown at the same pace since we started and i think right. that is what kind of distinguishes pratipi compared to any other companies very true very true in fact you know my question and my thesis stems from that article itself because in solidarity it can perhaps look like you know this is a great number but as you mentioned doing the right things for a constant period of time and letting it compound is the secret sauce so love love that thesis and great to see that the results are paying off 
and i hope that it continues to but moving to now let's say you know the indian ecosystem right uh, and i remember you mentioning that you were too comfortable in the job that you had at 24 and that's what that's what you didn't like right so perhaps grabbing your journey with the evolution of the indian ecosystem with everything you know building for india being the new buzzword vernacular content being the uh, tweet of the uh, you know uh, every on everybody's mind can you perhaps throw some lights on concepts that are you know macro in nature but specifically to let's say the indian ecosystem how have you seen uh, content evolve vernacular evolve and you know building for middle india evolve and how you conceptualize pratilipi like i leave the next 5 minutes to your flow but it'll be great to understand the context to you know pratilipi and how you look at content and how you seen it evolve in the ecosystem right so i think these are quite a few questions clubbed into one so let me kind right. of break them down and tackle them one sure. by one so broadly i think one thing is that uh, i personally believe uh, in the jeff bezos philosophy uh, which essentially says that you know it's very very hard to predict the future at what is going to happen but it's relatively easier to kind of try and predict what is not going to happen or what's definitely going to happen so for example this is obvious that given india's like current ecosystem and current situation uh, and in fact the same applied when we started building the clip that it was obvious that more and more people will come on come online and they will require different services and different types of content and so on and so forth uh, so it could have happened in a year it could have taken 5 years but like it it's almost a certainty that it's going to happen and the same is true today as well uh like given our population and the number of people who are on the internet it's almost like 100% sure that the number of people online are going to increase the number of people who are transacting online uh, the number of people who are consuming content online all of this has to increase the only real question is will it take one year will it take five years will it take 10 right. and i think as investors sometimes people have to kind of worry about market timing uh because like you have a fund cycle and things like that but as founders you don't necessarily have to like if you right. know that something is definitely going to happen then you can be a little bit more patient and kind of try and build a generation defining company because you have the skill set as well as the resilience to kind of wait out when the market really happens right. uh obviously then your strategy has to be a little bit different uh but the odds of success are much much higher right the second thing is that like every ecosystem uh kind of goes through a phases of maturity so in mm-hmm. india for example uh even like 10 15 20 years back the kind of risk that founders could take were very very different uh, primarily because of like the financial as well as societal constraints like it was not supposed to be a cool thing that you are starting a company on your own right uh, and like if you kind of tried and build a company of your own and it did not work out uh, you could take some serious negative points in when you are searching for your next job uh, and that has like changed drastically now if you have worked at a startup or if you have built a startup then even in the worst case you are probably at the same level as you were and in general you are actually much much further ahead in your career mm-hmm. because people have started valuing the kind of work that it requires to build a startup and i don't mean just as a founder but also as an early employee i think the exposure and the learning that you get is tremendous and people have started understanding that uh, not just in startups anymore but also in like kind of uh, larger corporates like amazon or google or facebook mm-hmm. uh, so that kind of gives people more faith and more hope and then obviously uh, like till about 10 15 years back for a vast majority of india their biggest worry was like just having a stability uh, like having enough money in the bank so that they can have food on the table our previous generation uh, did never have that kind of security that you know at least i will not have to worry hung- about like going hungry uh, mm-hmm. and that's still true for a large part of the country don't get me wrong but there are more and more people where it's not about survival anymore like you know that you can make enough money to at least get food on the table which mm-hmm. makes our generation a little bit more risk taking compared to for example my father's generation uh, or his father's generation so the newer founders are bolder than ever before and similarly the ecosystem itself has also matured so mm-hmm. because the risk taking appetite in general was lower the first wave of founders that came along 20 30 years back like infosys or tcs they essentially focused on services businesses where it was relatively easy to see how you become profitable how you are generating cash and so on and so forth mm-hmm. then the next generation that came along uh there people focused on like okay at least you have to create enough revenue from get go uh so that people understand how it makes money even if you're not making profit and that is where e-commerce and aggregators and all of those came along but today because the ecosystem has slightly matured people are taking even more risk so people are building uh like social networks or like for example a share chat people are building deep tech startups uh people are building ugc platforms messaging companies 
and all sort of different things that people can take a bet on where even if the odds of failure are higher if it works it can be beautiful are things that people are now trying on so i think the ecosystem itself kind of enables that kind of risk taking as well uh coming to the flippy's specific case and more broadly talking about content the same logic still applies like 10 years back vast majority of times people who wanted to build a content company or a media startup they would focus on models where you could be profitable very very quickly so for example they will create content for other people or they will open a translation company where you are translating content from uh like different languages to different languages india has been one of the biggest countries uh where a lot of translation work happens Right. then people started getting into ott and like other kind of platforms where again like the content itself has value but over last 3 4 5 years people have started building uh, ugc platforms where the primary constituent is technology and not necessarily the content creation so i remember when i was building prathipi one of my favorite questions to ask vcs was uh, that we have seen great enterprise companies we have seen great services companies we have seen great aggregators coming out of india why is it that we haven't seen a google or a facebook which are more ugc in nature coming out of india uh, yeah. and i think the at least the smart vcs all said the same thing that it's a function of market maturity that unless the market is mature enough both investors and founders uh, simply don't have that kind of risk appetite that it takes to build a ugc platform and uh, i think we were like lucky that when we started at least some people started looking at more long term more uh, risk risky bets uh, in the form of what is possible Uh, otherwise, I don't think Prathipi would have been possible. And the same goes for like the generation of startups that is coming along along with Prathipi. Uh, and again, share chat and short video space and all of these are examples. I think as the market matures, we will see more and more innovation in content uh, around formats, around languages, uh, around the mode of delivery, around monetization models, and everything else. Fair, fair. That that's a very comprehensive and you know, uh, elaborate answer to the ecosystem to Pratilipi and you know, part of what gives us context to let's say what we're going to further talk about. So diving into Pratilipi, right? So a storytelling platform which is more in the form of a marketplace as well. There is a demand side, there's a supply side, right? And as per like any any starting question, the curiosity dwells into the fact that how did you start with setting up the marketplace, right? Because I'm sure one side of the supply is always sorted, right? But the other side. side is something that suffers or in your case maybe both sides were suffering because there were already other apps like a, a medium for an english content or something like that was already existing right so how did you initially go about let's say setting up this marketplace and also like your co-founding story is something which is very you know peculiar in nature and the fact that you were able to transform your vision an idea that perceived into your mind and then be able to gather people and make sure that they have the same amount of ownership for your vision and believe in it to spend the most formative years of their life on it uh, how did you go about that as a leader would be very interesting to know right uh, so two separate questions right one is right. Uh, true for all kind of market places that how do you solve the chicken egg problem if you don't have supply how do you get demand and if you don't have demand then how do you get supply mm-hmm. and the second question uh, more around how do you build a team and how do you kind of keep them motivated and as ambitious and hungry as you are uh, right. if it is not really a vision that they follow uh, so let me try and answer the first one first i think in general if you are trying to build a marketplace you have to subsidize one of the two sides uh, heavily in the early days Uh, and different kind of models will go about it in different ways in pratipi's case what we said was that okay let us try and subsidize the supply side because our hypothesis was that demand side uh, will kind of come on its own as long as we have high quality supply uh, so what we did was that we reached out to about 300 uh, authors and tried to convince them that why they should publish on pratipi uh, almost everyone said no uh, so mostly their thesis was that you know what you have zero readers Uh, mm-hmm. and why would i take the pain and the effort to kind of come and make an account and then publish and then so on and so forth for like something where there are no readers so the way we thought of solving it essentially was that we said okay uh, the your negative points are basically that you have to spend some time and effort into doing this uh, and like if nobody reads it all that effort and time goes to waste so why don't we take it away uh, like all you have to do is say yes we will make your account we will upload your content uh if there are any reviews or if somebody asks any question or if somebody says anything nice we will tell you so you don't have to do anything so if people read it absolutely great if people don't read it it's still not taking too much of your time mm-hmm. uh and that is how like about 100 odd authors agreed 150 odd authors and that's how we essentially started uh the second thing that we did to seed the supply side was to get public domain content uh onto the platform so uh, different countries may have slightly different uh, copyright laws 
But in India, the law basically says that once a writer passes away, uh, 60 years post that, that content gets into public domain. So we got like some of that right. public domain content onto the platform so that when readers come, they actually have something to read. The third thing, once we got both of these together, was basically to make sure that once we get a writer, we don't lose them. So we focused a lot on like author happiness. Uh, we will kind of, this would be our number one priority by a big, big margin that how do we provide the best experience possible for our creators? Uh, what that did was that they, that created a lot of evangelists for us where these writers started thinking of us like as their children or their kids or their mentees. And they will go and talk to their own readers, other writers, their friends that you know what, this is a new platform that is being built by five young kids and you would love that and you should go and check it out. So I think that was probably the biggest growth uh, engine that we got in the early days. So that is kind of how we started and that is how we kind of got to some level of liquidity uh, before we started kind of pushing on growth. Now coming to team, I think this is another thing that is weird about the Clippy, but I think it's probably a lesson that other companies and other startups can also apply which has been that if you want to attract the best people and if you want them to perform at their level best, then you have to give them almost insane amount of uh, independence and ownership. So in Pratlipi's case, right from the very, very beginning, uh, one of the things that we incorporated in our culture was that uh, like we will be one of the most transparent, one of the most highest uh, ownership companies that you can think of. Uh, so if you join Pratlipi, it doesn't matter if you're an intern or if you're the CEO, uh, whatever you are doing, you get to make the final call. Everybody else can have their own opinions. Everybody else can have advice. Everybody else can argue. But finally, it's your call on what you want to do. Uh, that's not good in short term. It's a very, very inefficient method simply because a lot of times, uh, like you will not know as much about something that you are doing as somebody else would. But what it does is that it forces you to learn and grow at a faster pace. So which is why I think our people uh, generally grow at a much faster pace than most of the companies. Our product managers, for example, will typically understand marketing a lot better than uh, like most marketing people in different companies. Uh, what it also does is that people start taking more ownership about their own work as well as the overall product and the overall company because they can see that it's their decisions which is shaping the company. It's not like uh, the entire strategy is coming from the board or from the CEO or from a VP or whatever. It's mostly a collective where people are taking calls on what they want to do, how they want to do it, how it will impact. Sometimes they'll be right, sometimes they'll be wrong, uh, but they essentially start understanding that their own decision making, their own efforts actually like really, really uh, change uh, how the company behaves and what kind of outcomes can we expect. Uh, and once you give people that amount of independence, uh, then they kind of step up. So that has been at least my learning and our experience of while building Pratlipi, how to kind of both uh, attract and then kind of like keep these people on their toes where people are giving their best. Wow, this is this is spectacular. Like, I, especially the last part, it had so many components that I guess so much of what we could learn from because you speak about ownership, you speak about learning fast, transparency, all of these are traits, which are, I think, you know, spoken and fantasized a lot about, but I've not heard too many people practice it at the core of it. But the way you talking about it is absolutely, absolutely spectacular. I want to take a step back, Ranjit, and, you know, perhaps ask you a question that in hindsight, the marketplace problem seems very streamlined, right? You could give us a three-step approach of how you approached it, right? But I want to take a step back and ask you that while you were in the moment, right, what was your iterative process to perhaps tackle this, right? Because as you said, you asked the first hundred and they said no, right? And as a founder, it becomes difficult to digest. And these are pitfalls that young founders have to deal with, right? So if you can perhaps talk at the very fundamental level as to not maybe let's say tackle pitfalls but in any given scenario what's your decision making framework like or what are you thinking when in the moment things are not falling according to plan and you have to perhaps make a plan and then in hindsight only connect the dots as you know Steve Jobs says so if you if that makes sense to you I'll I'd love to hear your opinion on it so before I answer this I want to give a disclaimer I often say that people should play on their strengths. So what works for Patlipi or what works for Ranjit may not for sure. what works for you uh, at all. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, like I think something that has been always uh, how I have thought of myself and how I have tried to think of Patlipi is that I am not an expert and I have no freaking clue what is going to happen. Uh, both as an early product manager, as a founder, and as the CEO of the company, we always believe that you know we don't know what is going to work which means that we always start with the understanding that 
this is the problem that we want to solve we have no freaking clue what the solution will be we don't know how long it will take we don't know how many iterations will it take but as long as we know that it's the right problem to solve it's worth trying to solve and like something will figure out uh, over a period of time uh, so when we started building for example priplipi we basically said that we have no freaking clue what is the right product we have no freaking clue what is the right business model uh, we have no freaking clue what is the core value equation we said let us try something out and see how it goes Uh, and if it doesn't work, we'll iterate. So, which is why, like the first thing that I did uh, was not even find the co-founders. Was trying to validate if this is a work problem worth solving. Uh, so, the first step that I did, in fact, was to talk to about 400, 450 odd authors out of which, like 300 in person, in trying to understand if this is a problem worth solving at all. And in fact, the earlier I was saying, right, we reached out to 400 people and basically asked them to give us their content. These were the same people that had already spoken with. so there was already existing relationship which kind of helped us uh, reach out to them and say that you know what why don't you kind of come and publish on the platform uh, similarly on the product as well we could have taken 6 months to launch a product which looked sexy uh, and you know where we would, it would have made us uh, uh, it would have made it easier to hire people to fundraise and all of that but we essentially took the call that we have no freaking clue what is the product that's going to work out so let's start very very simple let's launch quickly and then iterate on top of that So the first version of the product basically just had a reader, and that's it. It would look very similar to a blog, uh, because any which case writers were not coming and publishing; they were just sending us their content, or they were just saying yes. So in fact, sometimes we will go on their blogs and get get content from there. Sometimes we'll actually like type the content because it was only available in a physical book. So we did not need to build a very sophisticated product. The product was basically you can come and read, and that's it. Uh, then we started seeing that people were sending us their reviews and all of that. So we built a review functionality. people can come and review now then we saw that people were kind of asking okay when is the next story coming out so we made a follow functionality okay you can follow people and get a notification on when they are publishing uh then we started getting so many emails where people will ask us to publish their story that we realized that this is manually simply not possible so we we built a writer panel so vast majority like i would guess that probably 90% of the features on prepp are not features that came from hypothesis or any kind of like genius uh they in fact came from readers demand or writers demand that this is what they want to do or this is what they want to pursue or this is a problem that they want to be solved so a lot of things that we did essentially came from the market or the users themselves and that is basically how we have kind of thought of and worked on pathlipi right from the very very beginning uh, and i'm not saying that all of those things worked out many of those didn't but that is the premise if the problem is worth solving uh, then it helps you to kind of stay motivated uh, not worry about like if five experiments are not working out because you already have decided that this is a problem worth solving If five experiments are not working out, the sixth one will or the seventh one will, uh, and that is the approach that we have taken. Amazing! This is again like very, very you know vivid in terms of explanation and goes to show that you know you have to have that open mind where you are up for learning and up for taking advice from the people that you are serving and focus on your core strengths and understand what your limitations are and approach it in that manner. So, so great to understand that. And stemming from there itself, you know, like it, it's amazing how you talk about the iterative process that you used. And I want to then, you know, move on to the kind of offerings Patilipi has, right? The different sort of content, and uh, you've now moved to and have made a public announcement, which goes to show that you are betting high on, let's say, podcasts, right? So, how have you looked at the multiple forms? of content that you have on the platform and how much of that has also been influenced by the consumers and how do they look at it because there is literature if i'm not wrong there are short stories and then there is also audio now podcasts and multiple other things that are on the radar right so would love to understand how the thesis of let's say build fast ship fast goes in a pratilipi and what's the execution cycle at so from let's say hypothesis which if not if it is not there and if the if you know inbound requests are coming in to execution to planning to what have you uh, so that be great to understand right before getting into the strategic part uh, i want to talk a little bit about the vision part and sure. this is something that i have been saying since we started building pratlipi but people did not really believe me was that like pratlipi's entire premise never was about reading and writing uh, it was never about literature for example it was always mm-hmm. about enabling people to share their stories with each other and literature uh, or reading writing was just one of those ways in which people share their stories so we always said that over a period of time uh, we will build multiple different products which will serve to multiple different use cases via multiple different formats uh, it's just that as a early stage startup you simply don't have enough resources or enough bandwidth to try out five different things so we started by focusing on online literature and that's what we did for like first four years four and a half years 
Uh, and once we got confident that this is something which has reached to a critical mass is when we started expanding into other formats. But that was always the plan. That is always uh, what we have been talking about internally that, you know, you have to start somewhere, uh, but this is just a beginning and there are a lot more that we want to do. With that said, to be fair, like different extensions that we have had till now have kind of uh, followed different trajectories. There hasn't been a single fixed agenda. Uh, sometimes it has been that, you know, what are the other formats that people kind of share their stories with and just uh, either listening to the market directly via customers or listening to the market via either like domestic competitors or global competitors, people who have been trying to solve the same storytelling problem in different ways. And then hypothesizing that maybe something like this can actually make sense. Uh, whenever we think of a format like that, the next question that we ask ourselves is that, is this something where we have a reasonable chance of winning? So for example, let's take audio. Uh, in audio, we saw that, you know, not just in India, in India also there were a bunch of people trying, but also in China, in Europe, in US, uh, like a lot of companies essentially using audio as a storytelling platform. Uh, that could have been audio books, that could have been podcasts, that could have been social audio, uh, or a bunch of other things. And we thought, okay, this seems like a legit form of storytelling. Uh, then the next question was, is there some way that we can actually, like we have a five, 10% chance of winning in this market. The way we thought about it was essentially that if you look at audio, the largest segment globally is music, uh, which is somewhere between $30 billion to $40 billion. The second largest segment is audio books, which is somewhere between $2 billion to $4 billion. And the third largest segment is podcast between a billion dollars to about a billion and a half dollars. And we thought within audiobooks, a vast majority of audiobooks were actually first like published as a physical book, and then they were converted into audio. And we thought, well, we have all the physical books or like literature part uh, that anybody in India can have. Like we are the leading player by a big, big margin. So why don't we just convert some of our own content into audiobooks uh, and try that out? And the thesis was that this is a segment because like we have a lot more supply. Uh, and the supply keeps on increasing because new writers continue to join and they continue to publish. So because we have an unfair advantage onto the supply side, uh, there, is a there is a reasonable chance that we can kind of build a leading uh, product here. And that's what the Clippy FMO started. Uh, then the Clippy Comics again came in a similar way. So we thought that, you know, Naver especially more than anybody else, and we have learned a lot from them, has a product called Naver Webtoon, uh, and which has been doing phenomenally well. Like some of their stories, and I have been an avid user of Webtoon itself, uh, are like absolutely marvelous. And we thought that these are great, but these are also usually based in Korean or Japanese context. Uh, why shouldn't there be more Indian comics coming along? And in fact, when I started reading, I started by reading like uh, all of these Hindi comics is like Nagra, Super Kondo Dhu, Doka, Pinky, Chacha Chaudhary. And we thought like these stories deserve to be told, uh, not just in India, but abroad as well. Uh, and we thought like nobody else kind of seems to be solving this, so why don't we go ahead? And again, the unfair advantage that we had was that some of our own stories were actually stories that would look great as a comic. And that's how we started the Clippy Comics. In fact, if you look at the Clippy Comics today, out of top 10 highest revenue generating comics on Clippy Comics, seven are based on Clippy stories. Uh, and that is something that we were hypothesizing that it might not be seven, it might be two or three, but it will at least give us some kind of advantage which will mean that there's some chance that we can win this market. That is also how we thought of when we acquired IBM Podcast. So Amit uh, focuses a lot on storytelling as a person. In fact, if there's one thing that IBM stands for, it's probably the quality of stories that they tell, the quality of podcasters that they get. Um, in almost every list or survey that I have seen for Indian podcast, IBM alone would have like five or six out of top 10 or top 12. Uh, and we thought that what if we can just kind of give them even more scale, we can give them even more resources, and they can kind of share even more great stories. And that's how we kind of decided on acquiring IBM. So this is the approach that we have been taking across the formats and products that we launched. Uh, but the specific insight might be slightly different. The specific trigger might be slightly different. But the vision always remains the same. And we want to make sure that we have a probabilistic chance of winning in that market. So that has been our approach till now. 
fair fair again i love the description and you know the detailing in the thought process but i want to you know you know focus on another thing there so a large part of what you mentioned goes with the strategy that amazon followed as well right it began as a marketplace for books it ventured out into multiple categories and that happens with scale which is perfectly understandable right so i have two questions here so as a founder who's venturing out early right how do you ensure that that vision that you know 10 year goal or 15 year goal or 50 year goal is in your mind at all all points and how do you maintain a balance between let's say pace and you know maturity of the market right so it would be very easy so you in briefly mentioned that you didn't have the resources but i want to understand further that is it a matter of resource or is it a matter of timing or is it a matter of pace because i'm sure that you know once you launch something there has to be enough time for it to let mature in the market for people to actually absorb it well enough and right right you can't go about right. things in a very fast manner either so if you can perhaps uh, maybe indulge with that and give us a clarity of things because the way you describing is very vivid and i'm sure in hindsight it seems very particular and as a consumer i can see through it but as a founder how can one envision it uh, at the very genesis of the idea or of the product is what i'm trying to understand here like i think that's a very important question in fact i keep on saying that the single biggest reason why i have seen smart people fail is the is because they are not focused enough uh, and they try to do too many things at the same time when they don't have the time or the energy or the bandwidth to pursue them uh so i want to start off with like one of the best pieces of advice that i have ever got uh, which was from narain at nexus so we were basically discussing about like the directions that prithvi can go into and i was talking about you know in 10 or 15 or 20 years what can prithvi stand for uh, and narain basically said that ranji long term is the only thing that happens because essentially like compounding needs time to be before it becomes powerful and that is really how you create generation defining companies so long term is the only thing that matters but and that's a huge but unless you kind of survive the short term you will never like reach the stage where you can see the effect of long term or effects of compounding so growing 20% year on year for warren buffet is absolutely great but he has to make sure that he doesn't run out of money where he has to sell all the all his holdings and i think that is a good way to think about when you are running a business so it's very very important to always keep your vision in mind in fact i would say like that should occupy 2 3 5% of your bandwidth at all time uh and you should always think about the next step that you are taking how does it kind of take you either closer or further away from your vision if it's taking you towards your vision great do it if it's taking you further away from your vision probably not there could be exceptions but by and large 99% of the time if it's not taking you towards your vision drop it. uh when you start i think it's important to start by focusing on something where there is a probabilistic chance that you can win and you should only start expanding from there to something else when you feel like there's a reasonable probability that now you are the market leader and now you have again you will never know for 100% sure but like you have a reasonable chance of winning this once you have that confidence only then should you venture into something else and i give example of either amazon or google a lot of times today if you look at either amazon or you look at google then it seems like both of them have like 100 different companies uh, like multiple hundreds probably products uh, and a lot of different experiments everything from like freaking rockets to balloons which are trying to give wifi and so on and so forth but if you look at their genesis amazon essentially just sold books for about 2 and 1/2 years or 3 years uh, google just focused on search for about 2 and 1/2 3 years and it's not about 2 and 1/2 years 3 years it's about amazon won the books market and then they started expanding into cds and everything else. similarly for google they were clearly the search leader before they expanding into other areas in fact i was talking to vinny vansal from flipkart a uh, couple of days back and he was essentially saying the same thing about flipkart that only when they got confident that they have won the books market did they expand into a new market and after that in fact this is something that he says has been one of their biggest mistakes that then they try to replicate it into five six different lines and they realize they simply do not have the resources or the bandwidth to directly go into five six categories so they rolled it back and then they again went in different categories one by one so i think it's really important to win the first battle that you have started uh, or at least have a healthy enough lead before you try to expand into another market at least that's my experience and that seems to be the case for majority of like large and successful companies fair enough fair enough great pointer there again and i think uh, it clarifies a lot of myths or maybe clarifies a lot of things that are essential to you know keep the eye on the ball on the greater version as well but surviving in the short term and winning in the short term as well 
uh, glad to hear that and let's say you know move on to another amazing factor so consumer success and consumer centricity is something which has been at the core of pratilipi and it shows right but instead of focusing on the the simple thing that consumer is the king which is initially very much possible i want to twist the question a bit and ask you about scale right so let's match scale with consumer success right and you mentioned in one of our previous conversations that which i loved and i can't harp on enough that you know you read every google play review of the app right so what i'm now trying to iat is how do you ensure that you stay true to your fundamental ethos of consumer is the king consumer success and you practice it despite the scale you are at right so you might be 25 million users you might have the highest retention with there is and i have a question on retention later but how do you ensure that the fundamental ethos does not go and how do you deal with let's say so many amount of users because the quantum of users is increasing and so the effort that goes into it and the priorities that you have in the administration the burden that you have as founders also increases right so how do you prioritize that and make sure that ethos is at the focus at all points and you don't lose sight of it like before that i want to talk about something else which is related to this uh, and this is a problem with a lot of consumer companies but probably uh, even bigger problem for enterprise companies where you have a single customer request and they are asking for a particular feature or a particular use case and you try you start trying to solve it and that can become very very messy very very quickly mm-hmm. so if you treat every piece of customer review uh, as a feature request and you decide to try and solve it very quickly your product will become unusable mm-hmm. so you have to listen to customer feedback but then you have to distill it down into what actually makes sense so in fact i often say that customer is king but you have to figure out who is your right customer so if you think of everybody as your customer is king and then every king has a different order then you can't really follow all those five orders and that is i think really really important for both consumer and enterprise companies now coming to prathipi the specific case and how we kind of look at it uh, is that just as i saying earlier right we always operate under the assumption that we don't really know what is going to work we don't really know how it is going to work we think of ourselves as students of this game and not the masters or the experts and like if you think of yourself as a student then customer reviews are like a cheat code like they give you insights into what your customers are thinking they give you insights into what might happen tomorrow because there would always be at least some people who would be ahead of the curve and if you are really listening to them then you can figure out to some degree of certainty that how is the world going to move so when you think of it like that then it becomes like part of your core job then it's not really a administrative task that you have to do but that is how you stay at the top of your game uh so i don't really think that i have to spend extra bandwidth or extra energy into doing this i think of this as like one of the key parts of my job and i have to kind of uh have a fair bit of idea about what my customers are saying what's going well what's not going well uh how their sentiments are changing over a period of time what kind of features do they need uh what is troubling them uh what are the future opportunities and so on and so forth so it's it comes i think quite naturally to us because we think of ourselves as students of the game and not masters of the game fair enough fair enough i think this goes back to the fact that you know you have such great fundamentals that it all evolves from there and it becomes complementary to the fundamental culture of the company so glad to hear that and you know like an extension of customer focus is also the demographics and the kind of market you are serving right and we keep talking about india to the market or you know let's say middle india or there can be so many synonyms that we can use but essentially you are serving a market which is underserved or traditionally not at the forefront of the country but increasingly now there are people who are building towards that market right but since you've been at the game for almost as long as anybody else or maybe even longer uh, if you have any particular insights to let's say how that part of the market is underserved and what are the ideal things that they need and how are they different from let's say a traditional urban market that we've observed which was you know evolving since the 2010s and what the 2020 this decade holds for the middle india market or the several other things that are there so that'd be interesting to understand and if you could perhaps give us a you know demographic split of the audience that you have because i'm sure that you know it's not a uh, true that you're just serving let's say that side of the market there are a lot of people in cities who want to still be connected to their regional languages and want to read in that language right so would love to understand these portions if possible so the first part is actually interesting because i think my opinion differs from most of the so called experts <laughs> uh, and in fact this has kind of kept on coming up since we started building patripi and it still comes up even now uh, early on for example lot of people used to talk about how english is aspirational language 
uh, and you know like everybody online will essentially come and con create and consume content in english and uh, which is probably why one of the first uh, like branding or let's say positioning that prepti had for itself was around that dreams don't have a language uh, exactly meaning that sapno ki koi bhasha nahi hoti Mm -hmm. uh, the entire premise of prakriti essentially has been that like people are people at the end of the day if you look at base desires of people or what they want to do it doesn't really differ that much between tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 places or india us japan like countries uh, or male and female or so on and so forth at the end of the day days base desires of people are fairly similar across continents across generations across age groups across genders and so on and so forth the difference that comes up essentially comes up from the fact of exposure and about priorities so it's just that people in tier 3 tier 4 towns or people who are let's say predominantly bengali users versus english users they might not have had as much exposure to a particular technology or a particular use case right. so sometimes you have to keep things very very simple sometimes you might have to spend some time and bandwidth and money into educating them and giving them enough exposure but that's probably about it type again like different people are really saying have similar aspirations uh, they want to kind of achieve similar things and so on and so forth so at least in our experience uh, that's how prakriti's product has evolved we don't really differentiate between somebody coming from delhi versus somebody coming from a small village in meerut uh, now coming to your second answer and probably second question and probably that will kind of tie this up so in prakriti's case for our main product which is the literature product uh, we have about 4% of our users who are nris Uh, or let's say like from outside india most of them are in rais then we have about 46% users who come from top 7 cities uh, and then we have about 50% 51% users who come from tier 3 tier 4 tier 5 places we have about 55% of our users who are women or females and about 45% users who are men and like again this is a pretty wide uh, demographic spread uh, both in terms of gender and in terms of location and similarly even within age uh, the majority of people about 73% are between 18 to 34 but we also have 16% users who are above the age of like 55 uh, and yet the same product kind of works for everyone because we try to kind of make sure that the product is simple enough where even people who haven't had that much exposure to like new technology or mobile apps even they can use it with ease and then the power features kind of are hidden where people who have had more exposure they can kind of go and use those Uh, without really hindering the experience of other people uh, and that seems to have worked well for us so my advice for anyone essentially is to instead of assuming or imagining that there is a india 2 and india 3 and india 5 and whatever it's probably just best to kind of think from first principles in terms of what makes sense for people in general uh, and like generally the same logic and the same similar at least principles will hold true across different demographics across different geographies fair fair again that's very fresh in nature because the more you know distinguishing factors we align with consumers the more we're adding to complexity if i may right you're distinguishing between layers and you're creating layers which are troublesome for the company itself so love the simplicity simplicity in the approach and you know a uh, great to have heard that uh, i have so Actually, many thoughts if, in my short if i may interrupt there's one more thing that i find funny that i want to talk about here for sure a lot of times people talk when they talk about companies like sharechat or daily hunt or prakriti uh, they talk about like vernacular startups or indian language startup or regional language startup or whatever right. and that's such a ridiculous like name because mm -hmm. think of it like this do people call amazon a english startup like mm -hmm. amazon is an e-commerce company or a shopping startup right. is uber a english startup like that doesn't even make sense what does that mean right. or is walmart a english company like it's not about the language you don't call uber a english company or amazon a english company yeah. you call them a transportation company or a e-commerce company or a shopping company for the sure. same holds true for like share chat or prakriti or daily hunt as well it's about the use case it's not about the language it's not like it's not about either the language or the tier 2 or tier 3 audiences it's largely about what is it that you are trying to do and i think this like when you start thinking of companies uh, from the perspective of like language or geography or the kind of people they are targeting instead of the value proposition then you miss the bigger point like right. if share chat has to succeed they have to think of themselves as a social networking or a like community startup and not as a vernacular startup vernacular or like language just happens to be one of the parameters that they are working on i think for that's sure. really really important for both founders but even more importantly for investors and journalists to understand 
Very true. I mean, like that's again, I think I might have been prey to that as well. But the categorization that we make is so f- futile in nature because it's it's very, you know, wrong of us to categorize India into multiple parts and then, you know, talk about building for middle India or vernacular startups per se. Because as you said, there are so many value, like in the essence of it, like we don't call medium uh, English speaking startup, right? Or something of the sort, right? Or Substack is a form of creators, right? It's for creators. We don't call it for a particular language per se or distinguish it that manner so i love that thought and it's great that we put it out there because it's very important for everybody to articulate effectively because otherwise it's a mental block that will continue to pass on from person to person and will never get clarified so love that thought and thanks for the clarification ranjit uh, that was great of you uh moving to let's say a uh, one last question on pratilipi and then we can close it down with a couple of questions on you and you as a founder so uh sure. one thing so I- i'll club it again and apologies for you know clubbing too many questions into one but prathilipi is uh, marvelous in terms of what they've done so here is a question on culture and hiring right and culture not in the broad sense of it but you've spoken in part about you know tri- uh, ownership and making sure that you know there's accountability or self accountability but i want to talk about vulnerability right how much of that in culture is important and to be able to you know approach somebody as a peer or a senior and be able to tell them that i don't know this or uh, i'm not being able to figure it out or be willing to take make that mistake right how much of that is something that you focused on as a founder and the second part is that a lot part of the people who would be listening and somebody who's 22 years old and somebody as a host as well i love to understand that what is what does a founder think of hiring at scale versus in e- in the initial days right uh, you know there can always be these jargons about hiring specialists versus generalist freshers versus experienced people but what is it that as a founder you're looking forward to uh, before you take somebody in as an employee and you make them in line with your vision right uh, before that i want to talk about something which is tangential to this but i think really really important mm-hmm. it's basically about the great culture or bad culture is not really about like what that means a uh, mm-hmm. great culture is a culture that is consistent a bad culture is culture that is inconsistent so like be it prathipi or be it any other company uh, just because people say it's a great culture doesn't mean it's a great culture for everyone in fact almost by definition a great culture should mean that it's a very good fit for certain kind of people and not a very good for certain other kind of people and it should be clear to people even from the outside whether it's a good fit for you or it's not a good fit for and that goes for like all kind of companies uh, early stage startups to like very very large corporations right uh, so i think it's very very important to be conscious about what kind of culture do you want to have and that doesn't necessarily mean that copy everything that prathipi does or copy everything that google does or uber does or mckinsey does like figure out what works best for you and then just make sure that you actually walk the talk that you are talking about uh, so in prathipi's case for example we value transparency and openness a lot which almost by definition means that we kind of are more honest and more vulnerable compared to most other places so in fact in our seed pitch deck there was a line saying that 90% chances prathipi fails and like when the ceo basically goes and says this to the outside world not even just to the team then everybody else also kind of starts thinking like that we are trying out a different experiment we are trying out and it could be a marketing experiment it could be a product experiment it could be a community experiment and if it doesn't work out it's fine because like our ceo literally goes and pitches to the investor that 90% chances this fails so i think like that has been almost a part of like how we think and how we work and how we make decisions so it kind of again it comes slightly naturally to me is it really important for all kind of companies probably not i'm absolutely fine if vulnerability is not one of the key traits of a particular culture uh, as long as other values of the company are also kind of aligned towards that right. uh, i do believe that it's probably better uh, to kind of have that open culture where people feel like they can be vulnerable uh, i think and my hypothesis is that that probably creates like a faster learning curve uh because people are willing to accept that they don't know something so they'll figure out answer for that they will talk to other people they will get help which will just help them grow at a faster pace but i don't know if it is absolutely essential right uh your second question was in terms of like how do you decide on hiring uh, right. especially as the company grows from a very small like group of people to a very large group of people in pratilipi's case and again i don't think there's a one size fits all policy in fact for sure a lot of people have often said that this is something that we haven't done well like we haven't been uh, the best at hiring uh, either in terms of like how quickly do we hire or in terms of 
kind of attracting people who are already achieved a lot in their lives. I think Pratipi has been a great place to grow people who are already here, but uh, we have to do a much better job in terms of attracting already talented and already accomplished people. But what we have seen or what has worked for us has been instead of focusing on people as a dot, like looking at people, what they have done, it's probably a lot better to look at people as lines, as journeys, that kind of reduces the number of biases that you have. And it also kind of helps you attract the kind of people who are more likely to grow quickly in the future. So as just one example, so I think a lot of companies, for example, talk about increasing diversity, uh, not just in terms of gender, but also in terms of like their own previous backgrounds, the kind of colleges that they attended, the kind of companies that they have previously worked on and so on and so forth. Uh, we have never focused on diversity. And I think, and I'm not saying that as a compliment, I'm just saying that as a matter of fact. But if you look at Pratipi's team, you will see that we are possibly one of the most diverse workplaces that you can think of. Like my head of product is a girl, my uh, VP engineer is a girl, my head of like my head of legal compliance, legal and compliance is a girl, and not just in like this. Uh, some of my best engineers don't even have a like computer science degree. In fact, some of my engineers don't even have an engineering degree. Uh, like our first DevOps guy was basically a dropout from college. And like all of this, the reason why this happens without us actively thinking about diversity is primarily because we look at people as people instead of looking at like just one dot where you are right now or where you have studied. So if you're coming from a relatively less privileged background and if you're looking at your entire journey, then that gives us a sense of that, dude, you had so many problems and you were still able to overcome these and you got to this point. Okay. And that generally is a good indicator that now that you are here and if we give you enough opportunities, you will continue to grow at a faster pace simply because of how much you have fought in the past. Like that's probably it. So one of, for example, our product managers uh, who in fact now runs her own startup, um, like she was probably like the first engineer in, I don't know, like almost every village nearby. Uh, she went to IIT Delhi, studied there, went to uh, Citibank and worked there. She had no experience in product. The reason why we hired her was because like the kind of background that she came from, it was impossibly hard to imagine that how do you kind of come, go from there to basically go to like one of the top engineering schools in the country uh, and then you go and join a bank and even there in your part time, you're still trying to build different products and so on and so forth. So like the reason why we hired her as a product manager was not because of anything that she had done per se. She had no experience of startups. She had never had any exposure to product but it was just that resilience and the resourcefulness that she had shown in the past that convinced us that she would probably be a good product manager. And that's generally how kind of Pratipi looks at hiring. Like we always look for people as people and we look at their path that they have taken to get to where they are instead of just looking at where they are right now. And I think that probably works best uh, for all kinds of companies. So I usually always say that, you know, this is good for certain kind of companies and this is not good for certain kind of companies. But I think this is one of those things that is probably good for every kind of company. Right, right. Incredible to hear that, you know, just the fact that you're looking at people, not just as commodities of people coming in and adding, you know, they're not a function of their features. They're more to that. And there is a comprehensive story that everybody brings on the table. And it's great to see you acknowledge that consciously. Also love the fact that you're so cognizant of your own limitations and the fact that you're tr transparent about it in public domain as well, right? So that's a great, great cue and makes me remind like, you know, your culture answer makes me remind that there is no good or bad culture to begin with right it's what suits you best it's a forward-looking culture or a or whatever what have you right but uh to classify it again in that is very different and it's great to see that you know some aspects of culture for Pratip worked out really well so marvelous this has been really really uh fantastic uh you know uh Ranjit and moving on to the last couple of 10 minutes where I'd love to know more about you and perhaps you know young founders can learn from your uh experiences so uh first up I want to ask you know like you know i asked uh mr chaitanya of wakefit the same question but i'm often fascinated by the fact that you know uh initially founders have to do the tough decisions that don't scale right like how paul graham puts it uh doing things that don't scale right and you've done so many of those right be it the 400 in-person interviews or be it hiring people firsthand making sure you have the right co-founders validating the thesis and what have you right so i'd love to perhaps not not talk about the things you did right but what you have to say about that uh in its entirety what do you think about that phrase and how do you advise uh early stage founders or aspiring founders to go about their initial journeys intricately with the context of that phrase 
I think that's a great phrase in general, especially for startups, because you are always resource constrained. So when you are always resource constrained, you want to kind of figure out quickly if something is worth pursuing or if something should be dropped. Like if you try and pursue five different things all at the same time, uh, you will never be great at any of those because there would be other people who would be pursuing only one of those, and they would obviously have more time and effort putting into that one area. So with that in mind, if you are trying to kind of decide quickly whether something is worth pursuing or not. then you probably want to figure it out as quickly as possible and there are some people who may be like unreasonably smart and who may be able to kind of figure out if something works like within their own head then that's great it's just that a lot of that will depend on luck so like even if you're really smart it's still a probabilistic world there's still a probability and that probability might be very high if you're really smart that you're right but luck is not really a very good strategy so like if you can kind of find out something then why depend on luck even if the probability is very high if you can't find out something then fine maybe it is a good strategy uh, but in general like depending on luck is not a good strategy which means you want to try and validate if something works with you which means that if you do it super manually uh, it will not scale of course but like because you are doing it super manually so it's very very easy to kind of actually get it done and see how it works uh, and then if it works then by all means you automate it and you make it scalable and robust and so on and so forth so i think that is probably the number one reason of why doing things that don't scale is a good idea but there is a second reason which is less talked about which is that sometimes when you are doing things manually right then you are forced to get your hands dirty uh, which means that you are learning at a faster pace now it might not be scalable it might not be efficient but you have to differentiate between efficiency and effectiveness and generally effectiveness is a lot more important especially when you are starting up versus efficiency and which means that the learning that you get when you are doing something super manually and you are forced to learn because well it's your own time and your own hands why are you are doing something is super valuable even if it's not very efficient so i think it's a great phrase and it's definitely something that people should keep in mind when they are building a company for sure for sure love that answer also and you know stemming from there uh, this is again something that always fascinates me right so as a founder uh, you have so much knowledge and you've conceived the idea you've come to light and you are always constantly thinking about pratilipi right and there is no better person than you and the co-founders to actually understand pratilipi better right but stemming from there right i'm sure that everybody is yeah, let's say a victim of their own experiences right and for sure you also get stuck sometimes right so what I'm I'm trying to eye at is as a founder, whom do you resort to when you are stuck, and what's your scope of you know, let's say, expanding vision? Like, like who's your mentor? How do you decide whose advice to take when? And how do you ensure that you're not bogged down by let's say everything that is going on with Pratilipi and ensuring that you upskill? Because I'm guessing that that is one of the most important factors for you to be able to contribute effectively enough and not get bogged down by administrational troubles, right? Because if that happens, the core of the innovation at the company falls short, despite everybody. Cont- continue to uh, continuing to do so so uh, if that makes sense to you i'd love your insights on how you think about this so i think of this uh, in three different parts uh, and the like first two kind of come naturally to me uh, actually first comes naturally to me second and third i have kind of trained myself to do so the mm-hmm. first one basically simply is that i read a lot which essentially means that a lot of times i don't have to make a mistake to see how it works a lot of times i can learn from other people's mistakes and if you remember i was talking about earlier that i am completely fine failing mm-hmm. uh, if it doesn't work fine as long as you're failing for the right reasons if there is a mistake that five people have already made uh, it makes no sense that you should have to make the same mistake and learn from that you will probably learn from the previous mistakes so i like that reading a lot kind of gives you a lot of different perspectives and helps you kind of stay fresh as well as have multiple perspectives instead of having just one perspective so that comes naturally to me then there are two things that i have taught my mind to do one is something that i think uh, is super valuable but it will be probably hard for people to learn because it takes time which is that i play a lot of like intellectual ping pong within my own head uh, so what that essentially means is that like i'll think of a decision and then i'll argue like i'll argue in my mind like why this may not work and why this may work it's as if like there is a ranjit a and there is a ranjit b and they are trying to have a very very vocal argument and like a will say no this makes sense and b will say no that makes sense and so on and so forth so that kind of forces me to think from different dimensions instead of you know just having a very uh, one sided argument and the third is just a, a kind of like a extension of this which is that i also love playing intellectual ping pong with other people and it's not necessarily about whether they know my business more than me it's basically about people who are smart 
and who don't take things on their ego who are like like who kind of like to be intellectually challenged and like funnily enough most of the smart people that you will meet they actually like that like the rush that it gives them to kind of have intellectual and rational arguments so it with me at least it can get very very heated in the moment and this is something that i've been trying to change about myself but what it does is that it forces both you and the other person to learn so i do this with my board i do this with some of our investors who are not on the board i do this with a lot of different founder friends and i do this with some people in the team as well so we'll pick something like any random topic out of the blue and we'll just kind of discuss why x makes sense versus why y makes sense and maybe i'm missing something maybe you are missing something sometimes even though one of us believes very strongly into something they will take a devil's advocate kind of role and they'll still argue the other side just to make sure that they're capturing everything so this is like a guilty pleasure for me uh, but it also kind of helps me uh, in terms of figuring out why something works instead of just assuming that the first thought in my mind is correct fair fair again like i i love that answer given that you know you are so particular about reasoning things out right like that is something that instead of just acting upon it like part of that is what startups are about but if you go into it with a blind shot i'm sure there's not going to result in a lot of things because that's a, a unconscious decision that you wouldn't take too much out of so, so that was by the way there is a there's an important point here right. uh, and which is something that i absolutely love a lot of times people kind of dif- don't differentiate between uh, a blind guess and educated guess so i am very fairly impulsive and a lot of times you will ask me something and i'll give you a answer immediately right away almost seemingly without thinking but what is happening here is not that i am not thinking it's more like that i have thought about it so many times in the past that it's a educated guess basis all those discussions so what seems like intuition for a lot of people not just like it's not nothing to do with me like in general uh, if you have already prepared in advance that intuition is actually prepared mind or that intuition is actually educated guess it's not a blind guess where you're saying this is not going to work out this is not going or this is going to work out so it's not a coin toss it's like a coin toss with a biased coin it's still some part luck but it's probably 80 90 95% probability that it's going to be correct so i often give people this example that uh, if you were asking a question about let's say space travel and if you're asking the same question to me and elon musk and neither of neither of us knew the answer uh probability of elon's answer being right is much much higher even though both of these are guesses because my guess is largely a blind guess and his guess is a still educated guess like it's a guess he doesn't know the answer but it's still educated guess which means that the probability of him being right is simply so much higher than my probability of being right for sure for sure yeah like that makes me you know go back and think about the fact that when people say go and do mistakes or take risks it's not about taking unconscious risks or unconscious mistakes right you have to be very conscious about what risk are you taking otherwise the output will not be something that you can analyze so again great clarification there and you know from there i want to move on to the second part second last question of this marvelous interview so here i want to talk a bit about you know uh, from what i've been observing as of now you have some certain belief systems and principles that you are fond of and you've been practicing throughout and that reflects in the culture of pratilipi as well right so uh, and vinod khosla says this very well that you know you have to as a leader have a belief system that is very reflective otherwise you are just being reactive as opposed to proactive in nature right so this is one thing which i'd love if you could address along with the fact that you know uh, you come from a place where not very often people come from and succeed to the likes of where you've reached right and for that you've not taken let's say streamlined decision or traditional decisions in the uh, name of it or the what we've observed over time right you had a decent enough b school you had a decent enough job but you went ahead and you know put yourself out there and you've uh, said in one of the interviews don't let other people decide what you do right so uh, the belief system question clubbed with let's say uh, if not a decision making framework because that might be advanced if you have one that be spectacular to hear but just the fact that what are you essentially considering before deciding that this is something i want to dedicate my time into would be a marvelous thing to hear like so there are two kind of incidents that i want to talk about uh one is that something that i decided a uh, long time back like maybe when i was 10 or 11 or 12 uh, so i decided that essentially you know life is too short and i want to have a variety of kind of experiences so i decided that if there is something that i either enjoy or that like it would force me to learn and grow or that it would make a great story to tell my children or grandchildren then i want to do it but like unless it's existential threat so i'll not do it if there's a real risk of me dying 
But apart from that, like as long as it passes one of these three criteria, I'll do it. Like it could be anything. Uh, the second part is something that I kind of decided in 2011. Uh, where I decided that I don't want to be like who I am. And a lot of times people say that you should remain what you are uh, or that you should never change and so on and so forth. In 2011, I decided that I want to be the person that I would be proud of. Like, I want to be the person that like, if there was an ultimate Ranji, he would respect and he would want to be a friends with. Uh, and then like, I have been very, very conscious about changing and learning and growing uh, to figure out like, okay, am I there yet? And the answer is never going to be yes. It's always like there are always things that you can learn and grow and improve. But that kind of forces me to have a much higher like like moral ground or ethical ground. It forces me to kind of put in my best efforts. It forces me to kind of take the like take everybody else's uh, perspective into account instead of just doing things on the whim. And it kind of forms the and like the entire core of my belief system. So a lot of things that I do, uh, like they seem or a lot of things that I think. They might seem like disparate in nature, but most of these kind of boil down to this one thing that I want to be the person that like, an alternate Ranjit would feel proud of to call as a friend. And like a lot of things that I do basically come from that. So that would probably be my answer. Wonderful, wonderful. That completely is very, very honest and spectacular of you to think in terms of a mental model. And I, I love that answer. Uh, this has been wonderful, Ranjit. And I, I won't do a good job at summarizing such an amazing conversation. But uh, thanks for your time. But, you know, as we end, I'd love that, you know, beyond the scope of things, like we've spoken a lot about, let's say, building a company, right? But there are I'm sure life lessons you've picked up along the way, right? And I'm sure this is like the journey is just getting started and there's a long, long way to go for you. But from your experience, like if there is anything that you'd perhaps, you know, learned in terms of life or let's say general principles that you can practice beyond the scope of, let's say, building a company, uh, it'd be great if you could present that as a parting thought and we can end on that note. Sure. Uh, I think like two things that I would want to talk about. One is, Something that we have discussed or we touched upon a little bit, uh, it's like it's a good idea to kind of understand how compounding works and understand that great things take time uh, and understand that even the small differences, either on the positive side or on the negative side, if they are consistently done over a long period of time, they can have massive impacts. So it's not very intuitive to understand compounding. Uh, it's not very intuitive to understand how power law works, but they are concepts which are worth dwelling deeper into and trying to understand. Uh, that would probably be one. Second is basically just like be faster to iterate across different things. Uh, so obviously people talk about iteration in terms of product, uh, but I think even in general, like the best kind of learning a lot of times, it's not about like how smart you were or how high your IQ was uh, or where you started. Like what really matters is how quickly you are getting better. And again, it kind of touches upon the compounding factor, but somebody who is growing at a faster pace, they will very, very quickly outgrow someone who started off a higher bar. So it's important to have multiple iterations. If you have a pitch, for example, uh, and your first pitch might be much, much better than my first pitch. But if I iterate on that pitch and quickly take feedback and learn and revise the pitch, like about after a number of pitches, my pitch would be significantly better than yours because of that feedback loop. Uh, and the same applies for, for example, things like problem solving, things like which idea is better, things like how you want to be as a person or anything else. I think it's really important to understand the power of feedback loops and iteration speed. Uh, these would probably be my two parting thoughts. Wonderful, wonderful. I mean, so compounding and, you know, understanding the power of, you know, how we can go about things in the right manner is something that is a great cue to end the episode with. Ranji, this has been such an honor and pleasure. I'm sure this is like, this has been one of my best conversations to the 30 odd episodes I've done. And I cannot thank you enough for spending your afternoon with me. So thank you so much for the honor and wish that Pratili PC is way more success than it already is and that you keep helping us Indians consume the best content that is. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot for having me here. It has been a pleasure. Glad to hear that. Wow, wow, wow. That was one episode I've really enjoyed because there was so much to learn and I just feel that the clarity of thought with Ranjit was extremely wonderful. If you liked the episode, do not forget to subscribe in. I will see you next week for another episode. Till then, I hope you recall. If you never try, you'll never know. Stay tuned.
and keep building